Here we are in Compton Acres, which is a um, rather nice spot in Bournemouth. Yeah, today I thought I'd talk a little bit about what the afterlife is like. Because um, when you look at these gardens and things, um, people often think the afterlife is like a garden, don't they? So let's consider that topic today. I believe there's a Japanese garden here that's uh, supposed to be rather nice. I remember it from before and it was all a bit crowded with the noise of kids but apart from that one gardener this place is totally totally empty. I'm the only one here. So what is the afterlife like? You know in so many classical ways that people depict the afterlife we often talk of it as being like a paradise, a garden. Uh, another world that's um, very, very similar to the world we know, isn't it? A sort of a glorified version, just like nature here is in its glorified form, a tamed form, uh, just the beauty enhanced um, rather than, you know, its wildness. And when we pass the next world, we often talk of it as being like a paradise-type world, you know, an afterlife that is... Um, just a beautiful place and so why is that is the afterlife really like that well first of all I have to think about this world that I'm seeing first of all I mean you're seeing this as a 3d not three, 360 degree picture you know you can scan around and have a look at a large part of this and some of those other images I showed you um, you can look around the setting and all this imagery that's coming into me is coming through as light coming from something outside of me going through the eye and forming an upside down picture on the back of my retina which then my brain somehow turns it up the right way without me having to think about what it's doing I never think about the world that retina on the back of my eye do you do I it's turned it up the right way so what I'm seeing and what you're seeing as you're watching this is actually nothing to do with outside we're watching a construct inside our brains aren't we this is something in my brain and you watching me watching this is something in your brain see what i mean it's just inside your brain you know, i'm looking at this and i'm seeing green but do you see green the same way as i do certainly difficult to argue what green looks like so we see in the world um through our <coughs> different visions aren't we we're seeing it <coughs> through a different way of seeing. So I'm seeing it one way, you're seeing it another. And um, if I was to take, say, for example, a hallucinogenic drug, I would see the world very differently. I'd see its construct in a different form. I'd start seeing its patterning. I'd start seeing it uh, like a fractal world. I'd start seeing it in a very different way to what I'm used to in my normal sort of filtered consciousness. So but what that kind of shows is that if we do something to the chemistry of the brain, the world around us changes. The very thing that we think of as being a solid reality is wiped away for a while. So even in this world, we can't really say what it is we're seeing. See, some people might be in a depressed mood when they come here, and they might see this in a much different way to somebody that's in a happy mood. If I brought kids down here, they wouldn't be seeing this. Their interest would probably be on the ice cream place that's actually closed, but back there that we pass. So you see your attention is drawn to the things that you're interested in. And if you think about it, we never see the world as a whole anyway. I mean, our minds is moving from one viewpoint to another. Just as if you flick this screen in this 360s, you can move from one viewpoint to another. We move our attention but we never see the whole lot at once, do we? We never really see the world as it is. So this world is limited by our brain. We can only perceive this level of reality through this mechanism we have called the brain, which in many ways is a filtering system because it doesn't let us see the whole. We have, it's determined by our attention moving, 
it's determined by our level of perceptions. Like, you know, I said about if someone was, perceptions were opened, the doors of perceptions were opened, as Aldous Huxley called it, um, you see it in a different way. So we are only seeing this external world through a filter. We don't even know what the reality is, because all of this is coming to something in ourselves that we consider to be us, our I, the centre of our the centre of the circle, as it were, the centre of our existence. But we know even that, when we turn our attention to that, is a mystery. So it's all determined by a moving perception. So what happens if you take the body away? What happens to the world, or what happens to our existence after death? I think the closest we can come to understanding what it is to exist without a body, because that's what it would be in the afterlife, is the state we find ourselves in dreams. Now, yes, in dreams we're still in a bodily state, but we've switched ourselves off from the outside world, haven't we? So we're, not, we're no longer being drawn by our perceptions. The perceptions have turned inwards, and the inner reality becomes the only reality for us. So when we're in a dream state, we are in a state of fluidity, we are experiencing the world very differently. We're not perceiving it through our perceptions, although it's trying to interpret it in terms of perceptions, isn't it? But we're seeing it in terms of um, emotions, feelings, allegories, symbols. But it's all still very real. I mean, sometimes, have you not had a dream sometimes where the dream has been as real as the world outside? Um, I have. These are what we call lucid dreams where you're kind of awake in the dream and you kind of know you're dreaming and yet you are kind of know you're asleep as well. So the world you experience there is totally different to the world we experience in waking life. So that world of dreams, I believe, comes a little bit close to what the world is like without a body completely when we enter the spirit. So you die. You leave your body. And the first feelings that people get, the first experience most people talk about when we die, is this classic experience of the near-death experience where you go through a tunnel. You go through a tunnel. And that could be our perception shutting down, the brain itself shutting down as we leave the physical body. Perhaps the experience as the brain shuts down and all the chemistry of the brain triggers, we, and we're about to step out of the body, we go down this tunnel. That could be the actual leaving process of the physical brain. But a lot of people interpret it as going from one place to another because you go into a new reality. Now, I don't believe heavenly plane is somewhere else, you know, just like I don't believe God is a man in the sky. And just as I don't believe that the dead souls of the stars in the sky, like the ancient Egyptians sometimes used to say. I believe this spirit world is somewhere that we could call another layer of reality, a quantum world of some sort, a world that is um, preempts this one, a world that is a greater awakening. So, in a way, the process of dying, even though you get that tunnel type of effect, the process of dying, I think, is more likely to be like a process of waking up. Like we wake up from a dream, from a dream state, and we wake up into a waking state, which we realise is even more perceptive and more alert than that dream state we were in. So when we enter the spirit world, I believe we wake up into the, what we will realise all of a sudden is it will seem completely natural to us. We'll say, ah, oh, <laughs> the birds like it. Yeah, that's what it's like, you know? That's what it's like. Of course I remember this. Because I believe we've been in the spirit world many times and we come back to this world many times. So when we wake up again in the spirit world, it's like waking up in our own home. We know what it's like. But the nature of perception there is so totally different to what perception there is sort of very... Um, we're, we're like looking through a tiny little hole at the world, you know? Because, I mean, like I say, we, even perception of the world is very limited. But what we experience in the spirit world is without body. And so that perception is kind of infinite in many ways, but obviously it has to have some form of concreteness to it, otherwise we could probably fall into a complete state of chaos. Now, I think the experience of the afterlife is different for different people because some people are more awake than others. 
So for some people, they could enter very abstract states of consciousness. You know, again, if I go back to the idea of someone taking psychedelics, a lot of people who take psychedelics see a perceptual changes in the world. But other times, psychedelics can open up complete abstract states of consciousness that are completely indescribable to anybody or anything because they are completely different states of being. And most people, when they start to find that, freak out and can't handle it. So it takes a person of already opened awareness to be able to enter those states. And we, we read about those in, in many people's experiences. Now, I'm not advocating taking um, any form of hallucinogenic, but I'm just saying, I'm saying it as a reason that we see the world differently, and each of us sees the world differently, and even the people in a higher state of uh, perception see the world differently to one another. So, so too it is in the spirit world, surely. Some people will enter abstract states of existence. But for the rest of the people who are used to this type of world that we're in now, they will experience the world kind of as they knew it when they left Earth. So, when someone like, say, Doris Stokes says to me, said to me, you know, I said, what is um, the person who was communicating from spirit? I said, what's he doing now? in the spirit world. She said, oh, he's playing cricket, you know. Now, Doris Stokes is a very quite simple sort of lady, but in her simplicity, she was a great medium, by the way. I've talked about her before, but um, when she had her, when she described it, I thought, God, that seems crazy to me, you know, playing cricket. You mean you leave this world and you go and play cricket? And what I think, I, what I learned from it is actually you do. You go into places that are familiar to you. You create a construct of a reality. Just like in a dream we create an artificial construct, so too in the spirit world we create a sort of construct. So I might enter the spirit world and supposing I might go to my grandmother's house, just like it was once as a child, a secure, safe place. And I might meet my grandmother there in a familiar environment that we both understand and know. You see? So we have a construct. We have a place where our souls can meet, where our spirit can meet. And I might meet my old friends from school, at school, and so forth. Because we create a reality so that we have a construct that we can communicate with each other. Because ultimately, even in this world, we are perhaps just specks of light. You know, we're just a soul. We're just the speck of light floating in infinite existence. But this world is around us, and our brains becomes the receiver of that spirit so that we can communicate with this world. You see, we're already in the spirit world. Our spirit is not here at all. It's communicating through this brain system. And so too in the spirit world. When we shed the body, then we have a completely different set of perceptions. So I hope that's not too complicated for some of you, but <coughs> perhaps there's some food for thought there. But how we experience existence. Um, there's so much more I could say about this. Um, so, the, so the afterlife is what you make it into. It becomes a reality that you are the constructor of the reality constantly. So the reality life, the reality, the reality of the afterlife is nothing whatsoever. It cannot be compared to this world because it's an endless flow of existence. And um, for some people, they may be able to see beyond that, into the absolute, into the divinity. And so too in this world, we can sometimes see into the divinity of existence. Um, so that's uh, the same place, isn't it? The same place we come here is the understanding of the divinity of ourselves. And so too in the afterlife, the same reality is that sense of I, which takes us to the sense of absolute. Do you know, I almost forgot to mention my books. So don't forget, have a look at my website and see some of the books I've written. I've got a new one coming out soon as well, um, but there's some interesting stuff going to be coming up when I go to India to write another book. So someone said, what, Craig, why don't you suggest that everybody has a drink every time they, you mention your books and we'd all be having a great time. So yeah, you go, have a sip of tea every time I mention my books. You get it just the once this time. Okay, thanks for joining me. See you soon. Bye for now. 
My wife Jane and I do our public work for free. We raise money through the theatres to raise money for our Hamilton Parker Foundation. This is a not-for-profit company that is soon to be registered as a charity. Now, our work is going in to help with the objectives of this charity, but you can help us as well by becoming what we call a patron of this channel. Now, as a patron, you'll get, first of all, all sorts of really interesting benefits. You'll have a sort of behind the scenes look at what goes on with our work. You'll get videos before other people. You'll get new videos. You'll get all sorts of um, benefits that are explained in the patron website and it has various tiers that you can subscribe to so you can subscribe to just a little bit and get a few benefits or you can subscribe a lot and get a lot of benefits and what this means is that we can raise some money through this channel now this money's not going to me and jane to make give us a fancy lifestyle this money is going into our foundation that has some fantastic objectives. Now, the first thing we want to do with the foundation is first of all, get a cyber center together, a cyber temple as it were, a place where we can introduce new people to you through this channel. So by supporting this channel and giving something to the, um, pay as a patron, you will find that this channel will start to get better and better content with more and more interesting things going on. We'll be able to get the cameras, we'll be able to have the space, we'll be able to have the right setting where we can build the energy to do things such as mediumistic circles and so forth online. But also our work extends further than that because we are hoping ultimately to build a spiritual center, a psychic ashram as it were, where people like you can come to visit and take part in an interactive way through this channel as well. But also we are doing a lot of what we call spiritual service. We are going out and giving a large part of the income we generate to people in India who are destitute. We've given to schools, we've fed children that are in need, we've helped mentally handicapped people, we've given cows to old people in India. Some of all this you'd have seen in my movie Mystic Journey to India on Amazon. But all of this is part of our mission, part of our remit to help the world. Because we're not only trying to find our divine nature, we're also trying to live what we learn and express it in ways that are really beneficial to the world. So if you follow this channel, but more importantly, if you become a patron of this channel, you can help us to take this whole mission onto a much higher level than any psychic work has ever been done before.